Coming up next on Boston Rock Talk, Kristen Hirsch, the leader of Throwing Muses, 50 Foot Wave, and also a solo artist. Welcome to Boston Rock Talk. I'm your host, Jim Sullivan, and today our guest is Kristen Hirsch, who wears a few hats, Throwing Muses, 50 Foot Wave, solo artist, which you are today, writer, mom, and a whole bunch of different things. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, Kristen and I have known each other going way back when she was a rat girl playing the Brat Club in Boston. Uh, when she was, I believe, 15, 14? When did you first start playing out with Throwing Muses? Oh, we were about 14. About 14. Yeah. Just a few years ago, in other words. So, yeah, yeah so. five or six. Um, <laughs> let me ask you where you stand with your various projects right now. Where are the Throwing Muses in your world? Uh, Throwing Muses just came off the road. We released our first record in a decade as a, a book. 32 songs and 33 essays, I think, mm -hmm. just because we were sick of music being reduced to little pieces of plastic, and so now it's it's still a little piece of plastic, <laughs> but it's stuck in a book, <laughs> which is still a valuable item, and it's something that doesn't offend anybody when you give it to them. It's like a gift. You give somebody a CD, you're sort of forcing your musical taste on them, uh -huh. you give them a book, and it's still a present. Oh, so. good. Canny. Good, good move. What's the book about? Is it like essays about it's, about the songs or do they have anything to do with the music I'm itself? not good at about mm -hmm. but <laughs> I'm good at sitting in a cloud of a song mm. and and writing so I try to keep that less pretentious than it sounds by including tour stories and you had I saw a, a uh, sort of in joke title for that record about pretentious something <laughs> what was it what did you call it do you remember what it was it was something well, they, the album is called what? Purgatory. Something to that effect. Yeah, something. It was a funny. <laughs> like, it was a very we funny. We suck is basically what <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was very funny. Well, uh, be because we, I don't know if we should be apologizing for the fact that we care so much, but we're too old to even care about that anymore. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's already a thing, you know, and, and that's, that's what we do. That's well, what we're we do. an art rock band and we, we can't really help it. We were tasked with complexity, and so we're not going to make anybody happy unless that's what they want. I remember when we talked a long time ago, you and Tanya, your half-sister, was in Throwing Muses at the time, and you were talking about uh, being tagged as art rock chicks, and initially went, are we that? And then you said, yeah, I guess that's what we are. <laughs> that was back. Everything hurt our feelings. They called us alternative before anybody had heard that. Mm -hmm. And so we thought alternative to what? To what? It just means like not music. I think it meant at the time alternative to boring arena rock. Hey, maybe you made it up. Maybe no, it's your fault. No, Somebody I have coined did. that. But, well, they're all bad terms, aren't they? I mean, <laughs> come on. Well, New Wave, how long did that? I mean, New Wave was briefly kind of fun and cool, and then it was like, no one's going to use that name anymore. You but. know, Yates had this theory that there are these inverted spirals in any art movement, and they begin with a, a density that is just mm -hmm. chaos. Mm -hmm. And as they expand and bring more people into the circle, they are accepted, and yet imitated until this ever-widening <laughs> circle just dissipates and there's no energy anymore. And in the middle of that is another little circle of chaos. And that's, good. And, and that's what we were. We were, we were dense. A little circle of chaos. <laughs> that's good. Um, where does 50 Foot Wave stand in? They're, they're more of a, they, you, they're more of a, a punk rock band kind of, right? Yeah, noise rock, math rock. We've been called lots of things. Mm -hmm. But um, another trio and... Yeah, it's it's loud and it's messy, but um, it's also kind. It's 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 fun. Mm -hmm. I don't think throwing muses was always <laughs> fun <laughs> or, or ever fun. But uh, Fifty Foot Wave is a celebratory endeavor, a mostly a live band, and we're halfway through um, our next record mm -hmm. right now. When do you hope to release that? You know that doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. That we I decided that we were never going to be um, part of the recording industry, so we have no label. I don't expect radio play. We get it, but that we <laughs> give the music away, and so we could do a million downloads and be considered 
failures as if we just dropped them out of a helicopter onto a third world well, country. Didn't you, didn't you two try that and it didn't really work out so well? I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. I was too busy. They didn't stuff your inbox? With, <laughs> no. But so we get used on like skate videos and it's sort of this power to the people thing where Excellent. we just think music should be freed by being free. And I guess finally in the music realm, solo, which you're doing right now for us here, playing solo. How does that fit into the grand scheme of things for you? Why do you do the solo work? How is that different from the other stuff? It was by accident initially. I recorded some acoustic songs for my husband, who happened to be my manager. And so I guess, I don't know if he was confused or just playing a trick on me, but he... <laughs> <laughs> he sent it to my business manager, Michael Seip, picked it up off of his desk and sent it to Warner Brothers and they said, oh, okay, we'll release this record. I was like, no, 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 it's not a record. And they said, yeah, it is, we're going to release it. I was like, uh-uh, you have to let me do it on purpose. So I did exactly the same thing, but on purpose, and that was my solo record. When was that? What year was that? Oh, I don't know, some years. Somewhere in the 90s or something. It was something. in the past. In the past. It was numbers. And what is, is there, a th is there a th another Throwing Muses album to come or are we kind of? I don't know. Is that on hiatus right now? You don't know. The songs determine that stuff. Yeah. Um, throwing Muses songs are written on my Strat or my Tele, 50 Foot Wave on my SGs or my Les Paul and then solo on my Collings guitars. The guitars mm. make the choice. Well, you've got that guitar here now. Would you like to uh, play a song for us and uh, tell us what it's going to be? I'll play uh, Crate from my last solo record, Crooked. Excellent. And now back to the hot seat where you're grilled about your songwriting. <laughs> Actually, I will ask you about your songwriting. We've talked about this in the past and you have explained it as songs sort of coming through you, kind of coming from above and working through you, I believe. Is that still what, am I right? And is that still what happens? It sounds so lame, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, can't take responsibility for them because I don't make them up, I hear them. Mm -hmm. And I copy them down. And I know that I got it wrong if the the lyrics, which I hear as phonetic melody, get stuck in my throat and feel like a lie. Uh, if the the chords sound like I've heard them too many times before, mm -hmm. or if they're emotionally manipulative, I know that I'm getting in the way. So my job is just to shut up, not get in the way. Not get in the way of the songs. Yeah. And I know one of the guys in the Muses, I think, talked about when he would hear the songs, uh, especially when you play them live, it was almost like a different person singing them. Than it, the he that he, the you that he knew. It turned out to be a different person, actually. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, that is. Yeah, what, yeah. I mean, the, I've been reading up about what's been going on in the past couple of years. I know you were at one point diagnosed as bipolar, schizophrenic. Those turned out not to be the case. You want right. to tell people what the case turned out to be? And yeah, uh, I, I'm. I have a feeling it's not that unusual. Um, that series of diagnoses and what it ended up being was split personality so called dissociative disorder mm -hmm. and all of my trauma, I, uh, all every sadness, anger, pain had gone into the music. So I was a very nice lady and the music was horrifying and that's how I dealt with a difficult life, you know. Um, there's always a harder life, but I didn't have an easy time of it. Mm -hmm. And this other personality had taken all of the pain and she only spoke in music and her name was Rat Girl. And when I went on stage, I'd be shaking with fear. I had a horrible stage fright because Kristen doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> Kristen can't write songs or even play guitar. Rat Girl, was one, the one who did it. So I, I went into a classic switching mode where I would shake and get cold and my eyes would glaze over and I'd focus on the distance and I would, I called it disappearing and people thought I was speaking metaphorically, <laughs> but dissociative people also call it disappearing. And I had no memory of having written any song, played any song. In between, I could get down on the floor and check my pedals and my set list and tune and 
and then as soon as the song began, bam, I wasn't even blinking anymore. I, I can't believe over the course of, you know, 25 years, there wasn't a single medical professional in an audience watching someone classically switch and didn't tell me. I didn't find out until this year. Where is that situation now then? I no longer hear music, so this may be it for my songs. I don't know. I'm playing songs that were written before I was treated for PTSD, which is what released the other personality. That was the result, I guess, of a bike accident when you were a kid? Was that that right? was just part of it. Oh, that was oh. the first time I heard the music. I had a double concussion and I heard her for the first time, but it had begun when I was a, a toddler. I think it always does that. It, it's a coping and survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, it's possible that I shouldn't have been cured. So, and what, what you're saying now is that the songs that have all been written were written by you as Rat Girl, mm -hmm. and you're not sure about songwriting now, that you can do that? Right. Wow. Uh, that's, that's bold I, to admit, I mean, in, in a lot of ways. I never Are sat down to write a song. I heard them. Are you scared about that, though, that maybe songs won't come? I'm relieved mm. and concerned because it's my religion. Right. Fear is... Um, uh, there's no place for fear in it. It's more like a, I got to remain standing. Yeah. yeah. You uh, are working on a book about a guy named Vic Chestnut, late singer-songwriter, who I liked very much. Obviously, you did. Um, did you know him personally? What was your relationship with him, and why did you decide to do the book? He opened for me on my first solo tour, mm -hmm. which was a, a hard thing for me to do. I'd always hidden behind my bandmates. I was very shy. Um, I, I had to learn to play uh, wearing contacts for the first time mm -hmm. so I could see the audience because I, when I tried to find the stool in the middle of the stage in these big theaters, I would like, you know, bump into it or fall off how it. How bad was your vision? I had to be able to see, yeah. How, how bad was your vision? Oh, pretty bad. Pretty bad? <laughs> <laughs> and when you bump into the mic, everybody hears it. It goes thunk. <laughs> so I had to learn to play while seeing yeah. the audience. And uh, so Vic was there for that, just laughing at me. And, and that went on for a couple of years. And we got pretty close because touring is very, very, very boring. Mm -hmm. It's also really stressful. It's like mm -hmm. being a firefighter. And so that brings people together. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was just funny as hell. And his songwriting, when it was good, was the best. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was asked to write what I thought was an article about Vic, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a book. On I love I, the title. What's the title again? Don't Suck, Don't Die. That's what we promised each other, and he broke that promise. He did break that promise. The latter promise. Yeah. Yeah. I know. You, uh, I think, have worked up a Vic Chestnut song for us today <laughs> when we talked about <laughs> doing this, this uh, show. Kristen said, I think I've got to kick my own ass to learn one. And I yeah, think you just, have, correct? Just a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, well yeah. that's the kind of show we are, spontaneous. So, uh, <laughs> what song are you playing by his? Um, Panic Pure. Panic Pure. This is what uh, Vic and I used to call the ham song. <laughs> <laughs> Am I sad? Yeah. Okay. I don't have any happy songs, I don't think. You know what, I, I remember this from way back when we talked. My, before I met you, and I just heard the music, I went, oh my God, this is gonna be a tough interview. She's dark and twisted and, ooh. And you and Tanya, at the time, we were having a dinner at some Japanese restaurant, and you, you guys were just giggle pusses. You were, yeah. You were so different off stage. You're really, from what, really, really nice. And we never stopped laughing. In fact, yeah. <laughs> that was all we had. It was, it's almost a weapon or a hiding place. Mm. And my band is still that. Yeah. And uh, that's what our bus is. If you're not laughing, then you're talking about something necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we don't get dark, you just, there's no, no place for it. There's, there's too much darkness, that's why. 
Yes. I want to read you something you said about fame, which I love. This is an interview we did, again, somewhere in the 90s, okay? <laughs> so I don't misquote you. I will read it. And uh, you said, you're always asked to be a little worse or a little more stupid to be successful. Uh, but it doesn't hit me deep. The alternative to it is being famous, and I don't like the fame that I have. We just try and entertain us. People never believe we're not trying to have a hit record. I'd rather be a waitress with a great band than a rock star in a lousy band. But I could never be a waitress because I'm always tripping over my own feet. <laughs> so that's, that's just a giant fail. <laughs> <laughs> An example of your early <laughs> day. It, it's true, though, and it's still true. We're still trying to refine our audience, not expand it. Refine, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I yeah. tried for years to say, you know, you have a soul. You have a spine. Music can move you. You shouldn't listen to crap. <laughs> just like you shouldn't eat crap. And, mm -hmm. Um, meaning is probably why we're here, so don't walk away from it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's out there. Uh, uh, music can save you, in other words. Yep. And, and, you know, <laughs> people's eyes just glaze over. That means absolutely nothing. It's like to sell them on religion by knocking on their door, which we also know doesn't work very well. <laughs> it doesn't work, right. But. <laughs> and so I've just started saying, you know, it's not for everyone. I don't think it's for you. <laughs> and their response is, gimme, gimme, gimme. But good point. It's a, it's a good selling technique, not that you intended it that way. But that's, that's, that's at least good. I try. I like that. I like that. Kristen Hurst refining our audience, winnowing out those who really don't care. But it's, it's true. The, the rare occasion when we had um, radio play, it was just a sea of like frat guys in baseball caps and their dates. You know, oh, yeah, those weren't right. women. They were like girl people, and we we wanted <laughs> we wanted grown ups. We wanted. <laughs> Smart people, no matter how old they were. Right. You know what I mean? Like, we, we used the terms young and old, not to mean age, but mm -hmm. to mean people who, were n who will never get it, but for varying reasons. Right, right. <laughs> it reminds me of seeing Nirvana uh, in the sta at the stadium level, and th the music was great, but the audience was so sucky. I mean, yeah. It was like what you just described. Yeah, that and has it, happened to me a few times, and um, I'm lucky enough to have been allowed to play in the corner of the business for so long. Mm -hmm that we have reverent audiences, the listening audiences, and I'm, in fact, I'm listener supported so that I don't have to engage in the recording I was industry. gonna ask you about that. It's called Cash Music, I think, your company or whatever. Can you explain a little it's bit about that? It's a non-profit mm -hmm. and it uh, provides tools for, um, to musicians to help them um, maintain, really. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's all about sustainability right now. Selling out uh, should never have been an option, is no longer an option. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, uh, that's, the stage is set for music to not suck anymore for that reason. We're not there yet. But if we can educate the public musically, make them musically literate, emotionally literate, you won't be able to lie to them much longer. You won't be able to feed them style over substance for too many more decades. They will demand quality and they will have spines and souls that can be moved by sound. But how many more decades will we be here, Christine? Well, I'm not gonna be here for Your it. Your children but, will be here, yeah. perhaps. Are, are you making a record that has to do with Wyatt, one of your sons? Hey, Did yeah. I say that? What, yeah. What? Um, my son, Wyatt, would come visit me at the studio. We lived in a farmhouse right up the street. Um, very dangerous, very expensive to live down the, uh, up the street from your studio. <laughs> so I, I didn't stay out of it. And uh, we'd walk down in the snow, and he would explore this abandoned building behind the studio called the Coyote Palace. Mm -hmm. And his, his expression, looking at it, he was flushed. He's on the autism spectrum. He's very focused and mm -hmm. brilliant and strange. And I just watched his eyes as he looked at this building there, where coyotes were living with old mattresses and silverware and stuff. And, and uh, Silverware? Well, the, the, the detritus of the people who had abandoned the building. Oh, they weren't using the silverware. They might have been. They might have been. We don't know. But, but Wyatt just needed it at, to the point where he was, it was almost an obsession. And then... Bam, in one minute it was gone. There is no more Coyote Palace in his psychology. And my, um, my drummer from Throwing Muses said it's because he needs to encapsulate sense memories so that he can filter them through his own psychology. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see it back in his art. He's an animator. And How old is he? 
She's 18. So it's just, just getting going in that area. And I, I realize that's, that's art. That's, you should be able, on a dime, to turn your back on your obsession and say it's now a gift. No, it's good. I would do a couple of more songs uh, to play us out, but I wanted to ask you one thing. You talked about over the years, I mean, especially when you were at your commercial peak, if you will, uh, about the way the music industry tried to pigeonhole female artists and, you know, just sort of the, the sensitive singer songwriter, the rebel, and all of that. Where are you now on all that? I mean, do you think the business has changed at all in that way, or does it affect you? Yeah, I don't in, in care any at way, all. Or you just don't <laughs> care. I never cared. You and never I really <laughs> don't care now. I, I wasn't um, presenting myself as such. Mm -hmm. I would hate to be writing for straight white females. That would just be evil. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I think it was a Village Voice preview said you should come to this Kristen Hurst show if only to see the bizarre cross section of humanity that will attend. And mm. I was proud. You know, publicists yeah, get true. mad because. It means I have no target audience, but I thought humanity is a target audience. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Didn't Spin Magazine try to dress you up for a photo shoot? In you, you tell the story. Rolling Stone did worse. Okay. But I don't need to talk about that. <laughs> what? what I, I walked out of the Spin one. That did, was just that was too much. What did they try to do with you? Um. I was supposed to marry John Stewart. It was going to be a rock and roll wedding, and I thought, he's not rock and roll. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> but I showed up because it was my job somehow, and uh, it, it just went downhill from there. My what I was supposed to wear was lacy underwear with the word "bride" written in rubies across the crotch, and. Um, <laughs> I thought, this is music? And when I thought that, my publicist said, we're leaving. And I sort of believed it. I, you know, I was on Warner Brothers. I, I, I bought the crap. Uh, yeah. not, not that I ever th thought it was OK, but I thought it worked. You know, I would, I would have to fight with them. I would say, why? Right. You sell crap. And they'd right. say, because crap sells. I was like, no, it's because you sell crap. And I still believed that crap sold, but I, I don't believe it anymore. I think people's listening tastes are much more idiosyncratic than we give them credit for. That's good. Well, why don't we play some non-crap to play us out of the show? Would you I'll like to do that?